my father was like, get your real estate license and come work for me. And essentially that's how it started. No money. And just got my real estate license. And I got to tell you, it's been 21 years of uh, real estate brokerage and development and acquisitions. And it's been uh, a, a wild ride. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Our guest today is Chris Okada. He's CEO of Okada and Company, a commercial real estate development, management, and brokerage firm based in New York City, uh, founded in 2002. So he focused on tenant representation, small, medium-sized companies, plus sales, leasing, middle market buildings across Manhattan. During the financial crisis in 2008 and 9, they refocused on distressed mortgages, collateralized collateralized by buildings in midtown Manhattan and uh, achieved nearly 700 million in distressed debt sales, but acquired core plus value add properties throughout New York City after market recovery. They have, man, they've done a lot, but he's, they've been in this business a long time. We talk a lot about uh, their focus. Why New York City? But I mean, that is their backyard and he knows that market so well, but also not just the market, but the asset class there, you're going to hear him talk about office. I mean, that has been their focus. And why office? And even what, what that looks like from the front row, you're going to hear it from Chris today. And, and again, this is a series, so you're going to hear him over a couple of days. I know you're going to learn a lot from Chris. Welcome to the show. Honored to have you on. I was looking at just your experience and, and even your focus in the market that you're in. I'm looking forward to diving in and just learning and why that market, your focus there, what's happened, and even going back a few years, lessons learned, whatnot over the next couple of segments. But honored to have you as a guest. Welcome. Thank you, Whitney, so much. I hope I can bring value to you and your listeners. And whatever, however I can help you, please let me know. Yeah, no, I'm grateful. Very grateful. Uh, well, let's just, let's jump right in. I want to hear we, I'd love to hear a little more background about yourself. Why real estate? What brought you to the market that you're in as well? But where did you come from? Maybe even before commercial real estate? Yeah, sure. So I am a second generation in commercial real estate in New York City. We are a family office. My father came to the United States from Tokyo, Japan in 1967. And really came from nothing and had $200 to his name and really wanted to live the American dream. And uh, after working in, in uh, vegetable and food companies for a couple of years, he opened a newspaper and it said, make your dreams come true, become a commercial real estate agent. <laughs> so he answered one of those ads in the New York Post or New York Times. Uh, and in 1969, started in commercial, being a commercial real estate agent. I focused mostly in, on New York City retail in, in Midtown Manhattan. And if you could imagine the 60s, uh, and I wasn't uh, born, but the 60s and the 70s were very different, especially in Midtown. And uh, he really made it, uh, a name for himself in the 70s and 80s by focusing and creating a niche, which is very important for those listening, created a niche representing large uh, manufacturers from Japan. And our biggest client was Toyota Motor Company, along with Honda, Mitsubishi, Panasonic, Kawasaki, and Suzuki, and every large manufacturer in the 70s was the beginning of globalization and the 80s. There, there was no internet. There wasn't go around the world. There wasn't really the New York City was globalization in the 70s and 80s and really took off during that time. That didn't promise me anything though. I, I graduated college and I I recently posted on my Instagram and on my LinkedIn, Chris Okada, for those of you on those platforms, 
And yeah, I had $38 to my name posted that I found the, the bank statement, 38 bucks. And back then Citibank charged $7 a month for bank fees or whatever. So I had a lot of college debt and car loans and I wanted to get into banking. I wanted to get into finance, being in the financial capital of the world, getting into banking, working at Morgan Stanley or working with any large investment bank was the dream. But as I briefly had mentioned to you before, I graduated after 9-11 and in, tw in 2002, it was the, the bottom of the market for the dot-com burst. Mm. So the dot-com bubble really started declining in 2000, 9-11 happened. There was another crash and it was just on its way down. And so I got, my father was like, get your real estate license and come work for me. And essentially that's how it started. No money. And just got my real estate license. And I got to tell you, it's been 21 years of uh, real estate brokerage and development and acquisitions. And it's been uh, a, a wild ride, if you will. It goes fast though. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I appreciate the backstory, even about your father. I, it was shaped so much by our influences like that, especially parents, right? And it's just a neat story, right? You said coming from Tokyo, I think you said in 67 with $200 yeah. or something. And so it's just incredible in how he became a an agent, real estate agent, and me and the, the path that took for your family, right? Uh, in, yeah. in real estate and even in New York City specifically, you know, you all are very focused from what I can tell and what you've said, it's like a New York city and even in office as well. Right. Yeah. I know there's a ton of questions that listeners have around man office, yeah. you know, like New York city, really an office, really? So I, I would, you know, you're the prime candidate to like fill the, fill us in right on why New York city, you know, why don't we start there, you know, first, and then we'll talk, maybe talk about office as well, or you can connect those or, or keep them separate either way. But let's talk about that. New, why focus so specifically in New York City and not go out to other markets, especially as a family right. office or whatnot? New York so, City itself. Great question. We have a family saying, and we have to adjust it now for inflation. But the family saying is there's a million dollars with your name on it. It's in your backyard, but you have to be the one to dig it up. So whatever your backyard is, wherever you are, whether Florida, Tennessee, Texas, California, there's a million dollars with your name on it. It's in your backyard, but it's up to you to dig it up. My backyard happens to be Midtown Manhattan. And this is really where I learned everything for all the good and bad that a, a large city has. I did spend time during the pandemic in Florida, my best friend lives in Palm Beach and in, in Palm Beach County in Southern Florida, a place called Delray Beach. And I, when the pandemic hit, I felt like everyone, and they still are, migrated south and anywhere on the Sun Belt. So really North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, there was so everyone went south. And so I spent time down in South Florida and I really just started doing what I always do, which is market research. I wanted to know what's the biggest sale, what's the biggest, who's the biggest owner, what are the biggest companies, how, what is the state's GDP, what is the uh, county's sort of estimated revenue streams and and I was just there and I didn't feel the buzz. I didn't feel the money. I didn't understand. And I looked at the data and I said, well, the South Florida, Miami, Palm Beach gross domestic product is somewhere in the 500 billion range. And New York City is 2.2 trillion gross domestic product. So the city has 
more GDP than a lot of most countries in the world. And so really it was a data based decision. And I came back to New York and I was like, all right, like, I thought we were done. I thought New York City was done. Not New York City was done, but I just thought that our firm was finished. Hmm. Our company is seven in 2020. It was 15 years old. And I thought, wow, 15 years and 60 days, you're done. And I came back to the office and I said, all right, is there any, are there any signs of life at all? And we came up with a slogan. I had one agent <laughs> that just didn't want to stay at home. They didn't want to work from home. They didn't want, and he just showed up and it was me and him. And he goes, guess what? This is like May or June of 2020. Guess what? <laughs> we got, we have life. I think the total commission for renting this office, it was a tiny office, was $500. Oh. 2020 was our worst year financially that we've ever had, worse than the financial crisis. And he was excited because it was a sign of life. 500 bucks, office, small space, 200 feet. We need those people in our life that see the, the cup half full, right? Yeah. I mean, he, he it was just because this associate's been with me since, um, I'd like to think, 15 years at this point. And we've done a lot of business together every year, lots of deals. But to see him say, hey, we got 500 bucks. <laughs> and us both lighting up over 500 bucks. Uh, because it was a sign of life and that's sort of what we want and what we needed to see. And if anyone out there, any one of your listeners are going through a tough financial situation and you will, and we all will, because our careers are up and down. I don't care what career you're in, but you will have highs and you will have lows. And if you don't, that means you haven't taken appropriate, measurable risk. And so all you got to do is just see one sign of life. And that's a clue. And if you're in the middle of a snowstorm, if you're in the middle of a blizzard, like the ones we have here in New York or a hurricane in, south, in the South, you're not looking th at the, uh, the d you're not looking three miles away. It's step by step. Uh, if you're in the middle of a blizzard, for example, you just want to get one step in front of the other. And that's what the $500, $500 means. Love that. Um, I feel like that's so wise when seeing the positive side of that. But then, man, just what you just said, you're going to be in blizzards, right? Especially if you're an entrepreneur. I mean, that's just, I love what you said too. If you're never feeling a blizzard, man, you're not taking enough risk probably, right? Or at least a little bit yeah. of a blizzard. I love that thought process. I think that's a challenge, right, to the listeners and myself. Uh, I, I've heard that even before I was an entrepreneur. I've heard so many people say, hey, it's, it's either feast or famine so often, right, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner. And, but I think you, every time there's a famine, there's also, and hopefully it, this happens, right, there's a lot of education that happens, uh -huh. right? I would say you see the next one coming better, right? You're better prepared, hopefully. And you're even able to know how to better resolve or take risk, right? More calculated risk maybe for the next time, but that's helpful. So highs and lows, I was, you know, what about, we talked about, man, you all are so focused there. I love the, the quote, there's a million dollars in your backyard. You have to go dig it up and you all are hyper-focused in that market. But what about the Hawaii office, especially now, right? Yeah. So very good question. So this is the asset class we grew up in. We established Toyota's global headquarters here in New York City. Same with Panasonic when they were a, a big, a large entity. And so they needed me. The owners call, were calling me and saying, Chris, 
can you help us rent our space? And I said, yeah, I just said, yes, I can help you rent space, but this is what we need. And then we, we took a step back. Everyone's on their cell phones. I'd like to think anywhere from 10 to 60% more in 2020. And now gradually, hopefully people are being more present when they're with their families or when they're at the office. But in the, during the pandemic, we were on our phones way more. Okay, so what does that mean? Social media has to increase. Virtual tours have to increase. Photography has to increase. Videography has to increase. Whatever we do, we need to now pivot fully to be on our cell phones. Because that's the only chance that people are really going to see. They're not going to see us on the MLS as much. Maybe they'll spend time on it. I mean, if you're in residential, everyone's on Zillow all the time looking at, even if you have your house, even if you have your home, your people are still looking just for maybe a dream home, the next home, their, their second home, did their house go up in value? People that are in real estate and in business just love browsing. So we have to be there. And commercial real estate, I'd like to think is around 10 years behind technologically, social media wise, advertising wise with residential. You see all the, the beautiful homes on social media. You don't see that in office. You mm. don't see that in retail. You don't see the, the, the social media influencers being like, oh, look at this beautiful office. You see them with these pools and these homes and the Ferraris and the Lamborghinis in California or Florida and here in New York City, the billion dollar pet, pet billionaire penthouses, a hundred million dollar, fifty million dollar apartments. So we just started shifting our strategy to be more mobile. And and because of that, the average commercial real estate executive, I'd like to think is in their fifties or in their 60s, and a lot of time in their 70s. So the demographic, which we bring being in our 40s and 30s and 20s, is we just needed to enhance the advertising. So we started doing that, and we started a, a office square footage counter. The clock started January 1, 2021. And You'll hear in the news that New York City has a hundred million square feet of vacant office. Hmm. So uh, what does that mean? I said, well, I think we could help out 3%. We'll help out 3% because the city has hundreds of millions of square feet in general. The vacancy is a hundred million feet. Even though we do a lot of business, we're still small. Uh, so I think that we can help out with 3%. And that's our post-pandemic contribution to this community here in New York City. So today we're at around 520,000 square feet of office square footage lease. Today we, are, we have transacted in 96 commercial leases here in Midtown Manhattan. That is a record for us. Our market share, we're up to 3 million square feet of exclusive agency. And we acquired one distressed uh, property in an area called the Flatiron District in Midtown South, really. And it's like the Ritz-Carlton is here and the Virgin yeah. Hotel just opened. And... Yeah, I'm all in on this. You're I'm all in. And so people outside are not doing well. They're I hear the complaints all the time. It's slow. But I believe and I saw that even with office, even in this evolving time, how does a landlord, you know, evolve with those times? How do investors evolve with those times? So now office when you think about an office space whether here or san fran or florida you think gray with cubicles and rows of cubicles but that's no longer the case 
you got to have things that are interesting, artwork, mm. design, thoughtfulness, TLC, l- lots of loving, lots of design, love, whatever it is you got, it, there's got to be something interesting. And so that's essentially what we encourage our owners to do. Yeah. What can they do? That's exciting. Is there an architect you like? Is there a gallery that you can collaborate with? Is there an influencer online that we could somehow do something interesting with social media? Get creative, get fun, get excitement, get loud, throw a party. Um, what I'm hearing too is what, and what I love about like the, the blizzard, like we were talking about earlier, right? It, it makes you think outside the box like you've never thought yeah. before, right? It makes you learn and do things and improve, right? In ways and get creative like you've never had to before. You thought you were maximizing that before, right? But now it's like, man, if we'd have thought of this <laughs> a long time ago, a number of these things, I speak to like just from the front row, right? Of the office space. How yeah. are buyers making it happen right now? How are they getting a lending if they are? <laughs> how are they financing these deals at the moment? Or how many Very are being converted question. from office to something else or thoughts around some of those things? Very good question. Let's talk micro and then we'll talk macro. We'll talk New York City and then we'll talk nationwide. Yeah. 100%. The workforce, how we work is changed forever. There's no question about it. I believe at the very best, depending on who it, on your, on your point of view, at the very best, we are a four day work week now in the office at the very best. Two to three is a lot more common. There are firms and technology companies that are 100% remote with a 2000 square foot small just to have a physical location and they could have 500 employees but just have a thousand feet just to have a mailing address the world is has changed the world is different forever in the united states maybe 20 30 years from now there may be a a massive some kind of financial problem and we as a country come together and we all say we're going back to the office because we need to win this war of some sort. But today, uh, it's been three and a half, uh, three and a half years since March of 2020, New York city is sitting at a 50%, uh, office occupancy, meaning that, uh, a big law firm uh, or a big accounting company may have 100,000 feet, but at the very top, the utilization of their space is 65 to 70%, and Mondays and maybe some Fridays, they're only at 25%. So New York City, on average, is around 50% utilization. That's one study by Castle Key Card Systems, which tracks the key cards. So this is their data and they have a a weekly uh, rating of uh, different cities around the country. We are stuck at 50%. We have been at 50%, has not improved. Uh, But Dallas, um, some areas of Texas are showing a 60%. So they're just a little more motivated than the rest of the country. Uh, But places, especially tech heavy centers like San Francisco, uh, when you hear ghost town, unfortunately, is still true. What does that mean now? What does that mean about investors? What does that mean about landlords? There's landlords that are tech heavy and office heavy are 100% suffering. There's no questions asked. This is not new news, though. This is obvious. Right. You're not using the space. You're not your value goes down. So you mentioned multiple things. One, financing. I don't care what asset class you are in, office, multi, hotels, industrial. When you have a 3% mortgage, 
And because of Jerome Powell increasing and the Fed to fight inflation, 5%, and now your 3% is around 8%. No matter what, you are negative leverage. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. The property value has come down because the debt service coverage ratio is more, is higher now. So if you had a million dollars of cash flow coming out and you were paying a mortgage and everything was fine and your mortgage is three and a half percent and nothing has changed, your property is a hundred percent lease. It's the darling of your portfolio. But the bank now is saying, oh, our interest rates are six and a half because you're, we love you. I know you're paying three and a half, but what that does is that almost doubles the interest rate and the monthly interest payment. And so I'm sorry, owner, you're going to have to do a cash in refinance. We're so used to the term cash out refinance. Right. We're now in the era of the cash in refinance. What does that mean? That means you're going to have to come out of your pocket and post another million bucks or two million bucks. And if you can, you're going to have to sell some other properties, to cover that. And that's sort of what we're seeing. We're seeing consolidation. Is that bad? Yes. Is that bad for everyone? No. Here's why it's not bad for everyone. Let's say you have no property. Let's say you have nothing and you are like, this is the market I've been waiting for because I have been waiting for this market. And even though we have a portfolio that is pre-pandemic, this is the post-pandemic era is the mo most favorable. If you can do two things, one, if you can gain, get access to capital, meaning equity capital. Okay. And because now you're, now the dust is settling. Okay. Office is still a problem. Industrial was so hot. It's now sort of correcting a little bit. Industrial is still on fire, but Amazon doesn't need, a mu need as much. Apartment buildings are still doing really well. They're still doing really well. If you're a new purchaser and you're like, okay, interest rates are six and a half, maybe six, maybe seven somewhere in this range and you're like that's just how it is that's just how it is 65 percent ltv based on a six and a half percent mortgage and the cap rate has to adjust a little bit which it will and i can put together the balance of the 35 percent in equity with this new lens you're in way better position than a guy that's just like oh no we have to figure out I'm used to interest rates being 3%. If you're able to say, this is the new environment, this is the environment I'm going to work on, I'm going to tell you you have a great next couple of years coming up. And we're in it now. We are in it now. Um, and I, I published a, a white paper called From Fear to Fortune because this is a generational and maybe once in a lifetime opportunity today, 2023, where there's so much upheaval and there's so much insecurity about cash in refis. And this is even every asset class that if you're able to figure out a way to get access to capital, to be selective on product, to align yourself with the bank, that is still lending, then this is an excellent time for you. And we all know that the United States for the past 40 years had a interest rate decline map and then it would spike and then it would come down. Then it was like, if you can borrow today at a six and a half or 7%, and the interest rates work in your favor. And in three years, they're back to six, five and a half, heck, even five. And you're used to this six and a half, seven percent market. You, my friend, will 2x in three to five years as a minimum on the appreciation, but your cash flow would hopefully still continue. And you're still getting 
your coupon. That's number one. Number two, if you're okay and you have access to capital, you don't need to go after large deals. Go after smaller deals, but all cash that are cash flowing. Like we're all like, oh no, we all try to. I have a deal. It was a $3.2 million purchase that I bought in 2015. The next deal after that was a uh, 15 million. The deal after that was 42 million. And the deal after that was 10 million. You know what the best behaving and most profitable deal was? The, the small, small, no, the $3 million oh, deal. Million. The three million dollar deal, the three, the smallest one. I say, wow, thank God I, because during the pandemic, it it was easy. Now I don't know if three million is big for you guys out there or small, but pull your money together. Get if you get good at pulling your money, and then get good at looking for product in your backyard, uh, and it doesn't have to be three million. It could be three hundred thousand. Could be three hundred thousand, but now I've not. I have never ever seen an eight percent capitalization rate. I have not ever seen a ten percent cash on cap. And people are like, "No, I got too many problems. I'm not gonna pay attention." A ten percent cash on cash. I mean, this is I've never seen that. So my days are filled with working in the business. If you take a step back turn the page, create a new, I, I don't know if you guys journal or whatever, but philosophically there, there should be a new book, a fresh new chapter, and it, it should be called From Fear to Fortune. You don't have to call it that. You could call it 23 and beyond or once in my lifetime. And we're here. If, Chris, if, man, we could continue this conversation forever. I love this. I, you just brought yeah. out so many great points. I. Unfortunately, we're going to end this segment, and and I want to okay. listen to that we're going to do another segment uh, tomorrow. They can come back and and uh, hear. And we're going to continue this conversation. I want to ask Chris about, about a few other things. Chris, tell them though where they can find this article from Fear to Fortune, but also where they can learn more about you. Great. So the first place is from fear to fortune dot net, and it's a white paper, and literally. It's a mathematical and historical uh, data a white paper on why this is the best time to buy because everyone's in pain. That's one. And social media on all platforms at Chris Okada, O-K-A-D-A. -A. For those listening on audio, Chris Okada on all social media platforms. And you can hear me ranting and raving about this is the best time ever uh, for, and thank you, Whitney, for having me here. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope that you have learned a lot from the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope you're telling your friends about the real estate syndication show and how they can also build wealth in real estate. You can also go to lifebridgecapital.com and start investing today.